I am Rockbot on all of the things, and I work at NPM as an engineering manager for the services team. The services team encompasses the website, the registry, uh, ops of all the things, and our enterprise product. So um, we do a lot of things in our very, very tiny team. And uh, for 99% of my career at NPM, it's been working on the website. So while most of my colleagues tend to talk a lot about the CLI or they talk about the registry, uh, I want to talk about the website and kind of lessons that we've learned over time about what it's like to work on this thing and all sorts of things. And I also want to give you a history of a website and how it came to be and all that good stuff. So first to get an understanding, how many of you use NPM? Okay, excellent. How many of you have gone to the NPM website, npmjs.com? Do you go, so, uh, how many of you have been there in the last month, the last week, the last day, multiple times a day? Y'all are my favorites. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, uh, NPM, let's kind of get started. So, a lot of people think NPM means Node Package Manager. Uh, fun fact, Isaac Schluter created NPM with like, and it has no prescribed meaning, right? Like, it, it's just NPM. It doesn't mean anything. It's just three letters. But if you want to think of it as the Node Package Manager, you can, because it is a package manager, but for JavaScript. And even that is a little bit of a misnomer, because there's C++, and there's Rust, and there's Go. Uh, there's all sorts of other languages in, in the registry, so you could really just say that NPM is a package manager. And I actually think it's a pretty good one at that. And at NPM, our number one priority is to reduce friction. We want to make it as easy as possible for you to just get stuff done. We don't want you to have to think about, well, how do I install this thing? How do I do all this stuff? No, no, no. Just, we want you to be able to do NPM install and then require whatever and you're done. Just keep on coding. Uh, now, NPM in and, of, in, in and of itself started out as an open source project, right? Node came out in 2009 and it was really exciting and people wanted to start sharing code and they're like, okay, well I built this little module and I want to share it with you. And everyone was like, yeah, I want to share it with you too. So people decided to create little package managers and one of them was Isaac's NPM. And, um, and that was pretty cool. But then something really interesting started happening. People started using NPM and Node a lot. And I'm talking a lot, a lot, right? Like this is just like hockey stick. Um, and this is just people installing, doing NPM install over time. And this is actually just the first few years of, of Node and, and, and NPM. Uh, and then what's also interesting is that people were contributing to the NPM ecosystem. It wasn't just that, oh, okay, well, we have people installing, but people were actually publishing packages to the NPM ecosystem at an alarming exponential rate. And this was really cool. But then, uh, how many people used Node in 2013? Okay, do you remember the dark times? It was like November, December, and the registry just kept going down. And you were like, oh my god, this needs to go to production like right now, and I can't install any packages, and this is like the worst thing in the entire world. Yeah, you're not alone. It was a terrible dark time in, in, in NPM's history. And here's the thing, it was open source, right? And how does open source work? It's all on volunteer time and, and, and boxes and all of that stuff. People volunteer their time and their software and their hardware and all of that stuff to make something really awesome. But when it's just volunteer and yet somehow people are putting this code into production and they really rely on it, it's no longer enough to just say, hey, wait a second, sorry, uh, we didn't have an ops person to take, over, take care of that whole like fire thing. Oops, you can't keep doing that. So in 2014, Isaac decided to turn NPM into a company. I know this kind of hit some people a little bit weird, but honestly it comes down to very, something very simple. We need to have an ecosystem by which we can pay people to keep the things that you need, the services that you trust and rely on, to stay up. Uh, I'm happy to say that in the last three years, uh, we have gone from the dark ages of end of 2013, where things just kind of kept going down all the time, to a registry uptime of 99.999, maybe 9%. Uh, so it's pretty good. And I mean, have people had any major issues installing lately? Hopefully not. I mean, I'm just gonna assume that since there are no hands raised that everything's perfect. Good, all right, moving on. So 
let's talk more about this website. Um, the first iteration of the website that ever existed was in mid-2010, and it looked like this. It's just a little landing page, right? It's like, yeah, uh, nothing to see here. Go to GitHub and do it all in the CLI, because no, just no website, carry on. That was fine, but a few months later, you start to see something a little bit more interesting, right? Now it's like, okay, well, here's how to install this thing and do these things. It's a little bit more iterative. And at this time, there are probably like tens of packages, totally great. And so someone was like, well, I need to be able to search this. And so there's a community member named Michael Rogers who created a couch app that made this, this little search thing. If it looks awful, it's because it was. But for 200 packages or less, it's fine, right? Totally fine. And that lasted for a really long time, uh, 18 months, in fact. And that was great. But then something really interesting happened. NPM became bundled in Node. Now it's not just some side project of like, oh, well, I use Node, and I guess I could use NPM to install my packages. But it actually became, NPM is the way to install packages if you're doing a Node project. And what this means is that with more people using Node, it meant more people using NPM. And so a few months after that, things grew like to the point where it's way more than 200 packages, right? Now we're starting to see 20,000 packages. 20,000 packages. Our little couch app of, of search, not enough. Now there's actually a web ecosystem, a web community, where people can start to look at, well, who's writing these things? And who is, uh, like, what are the popular things? What should I install? What shouldn't I install? What is well rated or whatever? So this is our first iteration of the website. It's kind of this uh, super special artisanal hand-rolled framework. It was, before, it was the same time as Express, but Express wasn't popular really yet. So it was you know, kind of special. Um, in fact, if you tried to do search at this time, it would just take you straight to Google because the Couch app completely just couldn't handle it. Um, Though eventually someone did, yay open source, uh, created an Elasticsearch instance. It was like, all right, look, there's this technology called Elasticsearch. We're gonna let you have, like, let's just use whatever. And I'm really sad to say that until December 2016, i.e. a month ago, uh, this was the same search that we were using. <laughs> so if you hated search before, I'm sorry. Uh, good news, it's not that bad anymore. Okay. So then January 1st, 2014, NPM becomes a company. And this is important for the website only because we finally put Google Analytics into stuff. Uh, then in mid-February of that same year, we created the first npmjs.com sort of thing. This is just a regular Squarespace website. Um, but npmjs.com is kind of the first web presence of, hey, we are in fact a company, and you know, company, company. Okay, nothing fancy, but great. Uh, not too long, uh, so about a year later, right, we finally get to the point where we're like, all right, that design was kind of weird, and also, why do we have a .com and a .org that's super strange because we're a company now, and it's not, it's not like a nonprofit or anything. It's still all open source, but uh, we decided we need to really start focusing on the users and, and the user experience and that look and feel, and so we got a new design. And you know, now people are getting paid to work on this stuff so we can actually take the time to implement all sorts of cool things. And we actually got rid of, of the hand-rolled, artisanal, bespoke framework and started using like, frameworks that are actually being used today. Uh, we chose Happy, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but hey, we have this new design, we have this new framework, and we actually started, creating, started using a service-oriented architecture, which was really neat. And that's important for a little bit later. But there's also something kind of interesting about this design. This is a little bit more of an aside, but there's this little wombat. What's up with that? A lot of people are like, what on earth is up with this wombat thing? Well, it turns out, if you take NPM and you turn it around, you get a WDU, which obviously means the Wombat Developer Union. You know, So obviously, we need a wombat as a little mascot. Uh, the real story of where this came from is uh, we had an intern one summer who was complaining about how uh, the internet was too slow, and I don't know what came over me. True story, I was the one who did this, but I said something on Slack like, well, obviously, dear innocent intern, 
The reason why the internet is slow is because the internet is a series of tubes, and sometimes they get clogged, and we have to wait for a, a pack of wombats with little pickaxes to clear those tubes up, and that's why it takes so long for things to get better. Where that came from, I have no idea, but it just kind of turned into that me and a wombat in a, nin in a ninja suit, and thus a wombat mascot was born. Anyway, yeah, carrying on. <laughs> Over time, we realized, hey, we have these products. We should probably let people know about them. So we started creating marketing pages and all of this good stuff. Um, remember again, the whole point of having products is that we can increase user value so that we can get them to pay us money so that we can never go down again. We never, ever, ever want to go down again if we can ever help it. Because, you know, y'all are our life. Okay. So fast forward to last month, and here's where we are today. We've, you know, got, we've launched three products on our website. We've got uh, NPM Enterprise, which is the having NPM, NPM behind your firewall. We've got NPM Solo, which is private packages. And then we have NPM Orgs, which is team management uh, for whatever you might want, of course, with packages. But what's really exciting about Christmas 2016 is that we launched our new search. And this is this is this one's particularly interesting because it's built on React and we're using Next.js for it. And really exciting, lots of cool stuff. Um, yeah. So all of this has all happened thanks to all of our users. And I like to think that we're doing something pretty alright because this graph is going uh, to the right and up, which I think is what you want your graphs to do, right? So uh, I like that. Throughout all of this, we have learned a ton of lessons, right? And, and this is what I, I hope to impart onto the rest of you. Uh, in the process of building this website, uh, I was the first employee at NPM. And the first thing I did was start to freak out because we were in this dark period of like everything's going down all the time. Uh, and I need to add stars to this website, which is the first bit of JavaScript that's ever been added to this to the site. So like, how do I do that? Do I want to use jQuery or what? I don't know. But anyway, the next week, uh, the second person to join NPM started, and her name's CJ Silverio, and she was like, stop everything. The first thing we're going to do is add metrics. And I was like, what are you talking about? We do not have time to just think about metrics. Metrics will get us nothing. Um, well, there's a reason why CJ is our CTO now, and I've only made it to a, you know engineering manager. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, metrics are what help you understand A, what your baseline is, and B, get an understanding of what it is that your users and your systems are doing without you having to directly ask them, right? Your metrics tell you if the changes that you've made to the product have been successful or if they failed. They tell you when things are breaking or when they've gotten wrong or everything is just, you know, kaput. You need metrics to understand where your system is at without anybody else telling you. The last thing you want is for Twitter to tell you when you're down. Experience that, it's the worst thing. Don't let that happen to you. You want your system to tell you before your users find out. <laughs> this is a bit controversial. Frameworks don't matter. It doesn't actually matter. At the end of the day, every single framework is opinionated in some way, shape, or form. And it's easy for you to think, oh, well, this new framework is super awesome and so great, and it's the hot new thing, so we should totally implement it. But there is a cost to every single time you implement a new framework. That said, for the love of all that is good, please use a framework, right? When I had to, when I first started at NPM, I was playing with Isaac's artisanal framework, and it was really clever. And there's nothing wrong with being clever, except Clever is only really useful when everyone agrees with how clever it is, right? At the end of the day, it took me six months to figure out how to add any code at all to this framework. And when you have, when you're planning on scaling a company, you don't want to, or even an open source project or anything, the last thing you want to do is have an extra level, an extra barrier to entry to getting people to contribute code. So when you have this really cool, clever, artisanal thing, that's super cool and awesome, but if it takes somebody six months to contribute, they're gonna choose to contribute on something else that's a lot easier that maybe they already know. So use a framework, just, it's a good idea. All right. 
in the process of, so as, as the first person to work on this website, I had the entire website in my head. That was super great. But then adding new people onto the team, they kept getting lost, right? Because they're like, well, how did you do this? What is going on? And that's because code bases are a lot like archaeological dig sites, right? You can see what happened, but you have no idea how or why. You just know there's a weird for loop here, and it's going through arrays in a really strange way. I don't understand. You can see what's happening. You just don't know why. And it, it was really important, I think, for me to realize that when other people are coming into your code base, they need more information about how to contribute in a really solid and helpful way. So that may mean adding more documentation. It may mean pairing. It may mean sitting down as a group and saying, OK, what are the decisions that we need to make? What are our goals, and how do we get there? You can't just assume that your code is going to speak for yourself. I don't care about self-documented code or anything like that. That is not enough. Speaking of code, you every time you push to production, right, you ever feel kind of nervous when you push to production? You're like, oh, is this going to work? Why are you nervous? The reason you're nervous is because you're not necessarily 100% confident, are you? So at the end of the day, it's really important to test your code and be confident in that code. So that means writing tests, and not just unit tests. We started out with some basic unit tests because honestly, any testing is better than no testing. But there were moments when we would push things out into production, or at least on the staging, because it's important to have multiple staging environments, by the way. Make sure you have a staging environment and then a production environment. Uh, so with the staging environment, we learned, oh my goodness, this change that I made totally broke the front end JavaScript for this other stuff, and now users can't pay us. Oops. Why did that happen? Was it because like the unit tests all packs perfectly, but we were missing integration tests. So I'm going to give a huge shout out to Nemo.js. It's created by the people behind PayPal, um, or it's created by, by PayPal. It's an open source project by PayPal, and it's a beautiful wrapper around, around Selenium, which in my experience, Selenium, Selenium can be a little tricky to implement, but Nemo.js makes it really easy, especially for those of us who like to write JavaScript and Node, to just kind of get that out of the way. And so now you have integration tests that you can really trust. Uh, speaking of trust, modularity. Everybody is always pushing for modularity, and I am a massive advocate for modularity. Obviously, not just because NPM is all about modules and packages, but also because you want to be able to separate different parts of your code in a way that everybody can feel like, OK, this one aspect of my application is being taken care of by this one other thing that has its own tests and everything like that. But we learned kind of the way every one of you have also learned that sometimes things don't quite work out the way you want it to. So we had a bug in our website uh, about a year ago where Every 32 hours or so, we had to restart our servers because there was a memory leak. And we were like, where is this coming from? I don't have time to be restarting my servers every 32 hours. And why 32? Uh, I don't know, but whatever. And it turns out the reason why we had to do that was because there was a dependent, like the website had a dependency that had a dependency that had a dependency that had a dependency that was written in C and had a memory leak in it. And it took us six months to determine, to find that one little bug. And it, the reason no one else had ever found that bug was because no one was using that particular tiny library at the same scale that we were. So, of course, thanks to open source, we were able to put in a pull request, and they merged that pull request, and then published the new package, and then we were able to get each module author along the way to increase their, you know, bump their package number and everything like that so that we could get everything up and running. And the memory leak was gone. But we learned, just like you've learned, that modularity is really, really like it, it's so dependent on trust. So we've been thinking about how to make it so that you don't have to worry about things like that ever again. Coming soon. All right. Yes. As you're building a website, this is particularly specific to websites. I think a lot of these other lessons are for everything else. But websites, for your company, for a lot of different departments in your company, the website is the only opportunity they have to, to work with users. So that's your support team, your marketing team, 
your documentation team, uh, all of the users who are trying to participate in your website, they all have opinions about what should go on the website. And figuring out how to balance all of those stakeholders is, uh, honestly, I think, I think people should just get master's degrees if they can figure out how to do that, because it is hard. It is really, really hard. But finally, this is one of the, actually this isn't finally, but second to finally, uh, one of the hardest lesson that we learned was that when you're building an open source product or project, it's not enough to just leave your code out there hanging. You have to actually engage with the community and be able to merge pull requests and respond to issues and do all of that stuff. Our team is tiny. The services team consists of seven people. I want you to think about that for a second. There are hundreds of thousands of users, actually millions, there are millions of users on NPM. And there are seven of us focused on the website, the registry, ops, and the enterprise product. And when all of y'all send in your issues and everything like that, we have a support team who goes, who is just amazing and they do everything they possibly can to handle the massive amounts of, of questions that you all have. We're a super tiny team, regardless. Especially on the website, we were getting issues and stuff, but at the same time, we had to push product out. And so the open source pieces kind of fell to the floor. And that was really, really sad. In addition, we, we were running, so because of the service-oriented architecture that we had created, we made it impossible, literally impossible, for anybody to try to run the website locally and then put in pull requests on their own. So now not only were we unable to respond to people's requests and uh, pull requests and issues, but we also couldn't even enable people to figure stuff out on their own. And then on top of that, we had, uh, in, we used Travis for continuous integration and we were, when you're, when you're an open source project, at least at the time, you were put into the open source queue, which when you're a website and you want to put in a security patch, it could take a little bit too long for us to get everything through so we could push to production. So we made a really, really hard decision to fork the public version of our website and make it private. And that's really tricky, right? Because people really rely on this whole idea of open source. I mean, everybody at NPM joined NPM because it was like, we're 100% open source and this is fantastic. Um, now we went ahead and forked it, and we went probably three to six months, and I have to say nobody noticed. Probably because we did such a terrible job of, of being open source citizens in the first place, but nobody noticed. Like three people maybe put in issues that were like, hey, wait a second, the CSS on there looks a lot different from the CSS in here. But besides that, no one seemed to care at all. So we made the really tough decision to just completely get rid of our public version of the website. And I think it's important to think about this as, is this really open source? What does open source really mean? Is it just putting your code out there and letting people look at it? Like, you know, just something really cute on, I don't know, on a poster or something? Like, that's what posters are for, that's not what open source is for. Um, you can think of it like view source, right? Is it open source or is it view source? We were really kind of engaging in a view source model. It wasn't that great. So in an effort to be better open source citizens, we figured we should probably just go ahead and shut this one off. Now, if there's one thing that is always a constant, especially in startup life, especially in open source life, it's that no matter what, change will always happen. So. We've gone through and we've changed a lot of things over time. We've done this and we've done that and we've, we've made good decisions and we've made not some good decisions and we've made people happy and unhappy, uh, both internally and externally, I promise you. But it's thanks to you, all of our users, who continue to use NPM and continue to reach out to us and give us feedback and tell us, hey, this is broken or hey, this is awesome that we can continue to do this change and try to make something really awesome for all of you. So uh, as a personal heartfelt thank you to all of you, uh, and thank you to uh, letting me kind of hang out here today. Remember, NPM really does love you. Thanks. Uh, and uh, if you want to ask questions, you can find me afterwards.
I have a couple of stickers with Wombats on them, so if you want some, get to me first. Okay.